How often have you guys asked me for a good deal sub 10,000? A starter watch, if you will. A watch on a budget, even though it's still a lot of money. Probably the most popular question that is asked of me, the entire sales team here at Luxury Bazaar. So me and Adrian, we kind of decided, you know what? Let me pick a bunch of watches that are 10,000 and under to show you guys outside of just Rolex. And this case, and everything that you see on this table is exactly that, it is sub 10,000. Under 10,000, that that's like the, the peak price point where people are more or less comfortable spending, right? It's not a big, it is a big risk in terms of, you know, in the general scheme of things, $10,000 is a lot of money for, for, for most people, right? But if, you're really? gonna, but if you're gonna put it into a toy, you know, people want, People want to be comfortable. Also, a lot of people uh, in this space, uh, there are more people in this space that refer to watch or watches as either a start of a collection or a collection. It's a lot easier to put a collection together based on brand complication, history, et cetera, et cetera, or some sort of a category, be it an independent watchmaker versus a, uh, a big brand or a big group. Uh, a, by sticking with pieces 10,000 under, three, four, five, six, seven thousand dollars it's a lot easier to build a collection. And a lot of people out there actually prefer uh, volume. Let's say for 100 grand, I'd rather have 10 watches than one watch for 100,000. Or in a collection, there's gonna be that one big piece and there's gonna be a bunch of little pieces because at the end of the day, people wanna take a watch box such as this, open it up and look at a collection. I remember we, had a, we actually had a, um, a conference call with a client one time and he uh, has probably one of my favorite collections and he had, we, we did the math, he had $27 million in his collection, right? A lot of pieces purchased at retail, some pieces purchased on the aftermarket. $27 million in watches, he had not a single watch, is over $500,000. He goes, his line of thinking was, I'm not there yet. I'm like, we not there yet. Like, you have $27 million in watches. But that goes back to your point. People are more comfortable having a little of a lot than a lot of a little, that makes sense, right? right. Rather have from 10 watches. Well, don't forget from a liquidity standpoint yeah. as well. Like, uh, I had somebody in my office the other day and they, they asked me about investing into gold and I told them, you know, I prefer physical gold. He's like, well, what do you buy? Like the big gold bars, the kilos? I was like, absolutely not. I hold all my gold in single coins. But I pull out one coin, that's $1,800. Yeah. You yeah, put out depends. a kilo bar of gold, what are you gonna do? Bite yeah. a chunk off yeah. of it, right? Yeah. Well, let's get back to watches. Yeah. Ten, so, 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 so the general rule of thumb, people want to, want to have $10,000 to spend and what has happened over the past two years in this bull market run, as I like to call it, was Rolex kind of got priced out of that 10,000 mark. And what I mean by priced out, we're talking about the modern stuff, right? The Submariners, even the Datejust, they got priced out. Air Kings, Mel Gauss, all got priced out of that $10,000 range. Now you can find older explorers in that $10,000 range. You can find Mel Gauss's there. You can find Oyster Perpetuals and some pre-owned Datejust. But I always tell people that there is so much bang for your buck out there under $10,000. Well, so. speaking of king of all watches, obviously Rolex yep. is going to be on the top of that line. And, uh, you know, I would probably say at least seven out of 10 people want that Rolex that's 10,000 and under in the likes of what I put on the watch stand, which mm -hmm. is we have the green OP. And again, these are the pieces that were priced themselves out, but neither the market took a correction. They have now come down to that more or less reasonable price. Let's start yeah. with the OP Green. Well, so the, the OP Green, it, the specific one we have here, is over $10,000, but it is near in that price. When listen, it's a $6,000 retail watch, right? right? So yeah, it can absolutely be at some point purchased 10,000 yeah. and Is below. this a new one or a pre-owned? This is a new one. Okay, a new so, one. We, had, so we had a pre-owned one that actually just sold, um, but How much yeah. did it sell for? Actually sold for 10,500. Okay, much. so it's so around that $10,000 $10, price. Let's move, price. Let's, let's move yeah, on so to- Air King is another going. That's a 116900 that does not have the new crown guard. Uh, these were trading at the peak of the market around 11 to 12,000 pending condition. Now it can be had under 7,500. So, so that, piece. Took, that took a big correction. It took but a big if, you, correction. if you consider the if you consider the fact that that was probably the least popular Rolex ever made, well, the older always, version, always, it was always like the, always. that least popular. The, this dial never took off, which actually I feel is a shame. Well, this really, dial is obviously an upgrade from the Air King line yeah. as to what it was before. But it is gen generally from the Rolex sports models, it is the uh, least expensive. Now we sure. talked we talked in the past about the Explorers, right? Yep. And even before the hype started. We talked about the older style explorers, both the white and the black dials. Polar, uh, Polar Explorer is, in my opinion, from a Rolex standpoint, the best, the best bang for your buck. From a history standpoint, from the utility behind it and just the overall aesthetics of the watch. So 
At the time, me and you started talking about the older explorers and the fact that they were valued. There were five, six thousand dollar watches, yeah. and they went and they went up to a little bit over ten thousand dollars. Would you say around yeah. that ten thousand yeah. mark? And now, where are they at? Uh, right now, so a Polar Explorer holes case with box and papers is eighty five hundred dollars. So they kind of stabilized, yeah. but they stabilized a good thirty percent over from the time we started talking about it. that right. wasn't that long ago. Right. You know what I mean? So so Rolex obviously is a good choice under ten thousand dollars. And contrary to all believe there are plenty, plenty of Rolexes out there sub uh, ten thousand. Speaking speaking of subs, how about the sub? Here's another good example for you. Tell me about this guy. Yeah, so uh, th this so this is a 116610LN, so this is a ceramic sub, but this has no box and papers. But for those out there who box and papers aren't the biggest deal, because you know you have a lot of collectors that want the full package, but there's some out there that really don't care for it, they would rather just put the watch on wrist and actually get use out of it, because let's face it, some mariners are used, right? People wear them on the daily. Uh, so a piece like that can be had for right around the ten thousand dollar mark. No I was, I was talking to Paul Thorpe the other day, and he, he talked about you know the Rolex Mariner. One of the things he said on one of the videos we did together, actually, he goes, "If you're in London and you pick up a rock yeah. and you throw it, yeah. odds are it will hit a Rolex Mariner." That's, very <laughs> That's true. how popular this watch is. But look, why did I start with Rolex? Because you know what? At the end of the day, Rolex is king, and you guys out there looking for options ten thousand and under, you're going to reach for a Rolex most likely most than other watches. Yeah. But I also would like to bring up the fact that there are plenty of options out there. I can sit here and name you 50 brands off the top of my head that you can go with, and they will, hit, they will still have that 10,000 and under option. But I'm just gonna go right down the line, and I'm gonna go to the second most popular selling brand, and that is Cartier. And this is one of my favorites. When they, when they redid the Santos in the XL case, right? This goes back probably a good 10 years at this point. I was like, wow, finally one of the most iconic watches out there done in a case size that's actually doesn't look like a lady's watch on right. wrist, right? And when they did the XL version, the non-chrono, the chrono, I was, I was all about it. And till this day, they continually make them and they are successful. There's a reason Cartier is the number, one, number two selling brand. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? So I really like the, the new Santos that they make on the bracelet with the blue dial, with the white dial. And as we've seen, we've seen a major surge for icing them out. That's kind of become the new norm, which again, mm -hmm. same thing that happened to Patek Philippe before was they sh shot the prices of them up. Um, but as an everyday wear, uh, Cartier is usually synonymous with elegance, right? It's usually synonymous with, with jewelry. It's synonymous with, with uh, a piece that you wear with a suit, a piece that you wear in a business setting. But they really did a really good job, especially starting with the watch like that and making the case size bigger and making it a, a very sporty feel. And it looks great too. I mean, we just sold today, we sold the, the black ALD DLC one for eight thousand dollars under ten thousand that's one of the that best one is, watches that one have. is slightly small and with that one is slightly small so i like the way i like the way cartier switched gears and switched gears rather quickly yeah. uh, at the time they came out with the excels the bigger bigger and better was the thing and as companies started to tone it down they still continued producing these mm -hmm. but they quickly were able to tone it down just a tiny bit it's not too small it's not too yeah they big. found a, they found the sweet spot they, they found they found sweet, spot. and guess yeah. what i yeah, i don't doubt that it, once trends start to change even further we go back to the bigger watches they'll pick right back up where they started from. But I've always said that, you know, if you want to go to the second best selling brand, uh, which is Cartier, believe it or not, most people think it's Omega, it's actually Cartier, at least as of last year's numbers. You just can't go wrong with the Santos, uh, especially some of, some of the uh, Santos XLs, the plain ones. It's a watch you're picking up around that $4,000 price range, 4,500 depending on condition. And guess what? It's a big deal. It's a very recognizable watch on a wrist because a lot of people, when they get into, uh, you know, picking up a watch, like, well, you know, if I put on a Richard Mille on my wrist or a rose gold Royal Oak, people will know exactly where it is. Believe me, a lot more people are going to know what that is on your wrist versus Cartier, versus, versus, let's say, a even a Royal Oak rose gold chronograph, if you will. Absolutely. Uh, let's go to the third best selling brand, and that's going to be Omega. Now, for Omega, for me, it's always been. Is, is about it's been about the speedmasters. One of the things that one of the things that um, people always reach for in their collection that you always hear people talk about the fact I gotta have a speedy in my collection. Yeah. It's almost it's become a cliche. Like when you say the word watch collection, somewhere in there somebody is going to say speedy. But it's not just about the speedies. There's plenty of cool things out there like Seamasters and mm -hmm. and plenty of other lines out there. Even the Constellation, believe it or not, which is a pretty iconic watch designed by Genta. So. When I look at Omega, pretty much any sports Omega that's out there in a stainless steel today, you're going to be a 10,000 under. But the cool thing about Omega is 
they make a ton of limited editions. For some reason, they don't catch as much hate as, let's say, Hublot, right? Right. You know what I mean? Although they make a lot more limited editions than Hublot does. And with that said, because people have kind of gotten used to that fact. They're used to the fact that, look, a lot of space stuff, right? Like this, 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 old, this, uh, like this old Speedy that has the silver coin. Would it be fair to say that Omega makes limited editions for much more prestigious events or times in history? Right. Well, Omega's when been on the Olympics been or on the an Apollo landing, right? It, it, it's, it becomes synonymous with, with times in history that are important. Omega has Whereas Hublot will make a limited edition because the sun came up at 7 Eleven instead, instead of, of 7 12. Exactly, right? So That's the new 7 Eleven uh, Hublot Fusion <laughs> Classic, right? And guys, don't knock Hublot. I like uh, Hublot, okay? We're just, we're just making jokes. But look, with that said, I will tell you this Omega has two big things. Three big things, I should say Olympics. Space, space, James Bond, right? I, what, I do you, what do you think of the new James Bond? The, love ra- it. the rainbow. No, no. Oh, no. the rainbow. Uh, that's uh, mm. it's an interesting. Uh, Why did they do that? I don't mind other companies jumping did, did on the bandwagon. Did you read any reading about it? No, but I, I didn't see any reading specifically in regards to the rainbow bezel. I don't mind companies jumping on the bandwagon, but that rainbow bezel and that watch just do not go together. I don't mind, like I said, take that rainbow bezel and put it into something else, not a James Bond watch. No, for sure. You know what I mean? Uh, Speaking of uh, other cliche, oh, you must have one of these in your collection, Grand Seiko, right, is another one that everybody wants to reach. Everybody wants to have a Grand Seiko. I almost feel like the Grand Seiko needs some sort of a rebranding because anytime you say the word Seiko, you're like, oh, I can sold one of these for 50 bucks at a flea market, right? And then you get into a watch that's raised around $6,500 like this one, and people have a really hard time, but for some odd reason, and I I don't have an explanation for it, again, when you're talking about watch and watch collections, especially from collectors that collect multitude of watches in that 10,000 and under price, you will always find a Grand Seiko. Let's talk about something outside the norm. Let's talk about, oh, no, let's talk about Bulgari, right? And again, when people think of Bulgari, people think of jewelry. I will say this. Although they're synonymous with jewelry, some of their watches are absolutely incredible. From the design, from the dials, from there, there's so much to be said about it. And this world timer right here, you're talking about a beautiful world timer under seven thousand dollars. Okay, well, let's start with the fact that this is a Genta design. Genta right? design. So right. if you guys are familiar, uh, Bulgari bought over Daniel Roth, which we'll talk about in a minute, and also bought, bought over uh, Gerald Genta. When they took the classic Genta Octo design and they put it in a line of watches, beat the Ultra Thin, beat the World Time, beat everything about them, just to me, again, being a Genta fan, obviously, to me, screams class. But when you're talking about a world time watch that's under $10,000. That's what I'm saying, it's incredible. The, the, the work that they do, the bracelet is absolutely amazing. I think, I think this bracelet rivals that of the Royal Oak. It rivals that of, I think it's definitely better than the Nautilus bracelet, if you ask me. Just everything about it is super well made from a big company. But I'm gonna back up and say, you know, because we do sell jewelry around here too, and we have some experience. Uh, Bulgari is probably our number one selling brand. I cannot get enough Bulgari jewelry in as it flies out the door. And there's one simple reason for that. Yes, we live in the world of the Harry Winstons and the Van Cleef and our Pearls and even Cartier, but I feel like Bulgari's just become a little bit more rock and roll and not as traditional. And bottom line is their jewelry just looks good. And they took that same concept and they translated it into watches. If you look at some of their watches and you take the name off and just, if I gave you a blank slate and I gave you some of the new models they've come out with, it's a beautiful watch. And guess what, it's from the iconic designer. It cannot not be a beautiful watch because Gerald Genta is the greatest Watch designer that ever lived, as far as I'm concerned. So Bulgari is definitely a good option Great for that ten thousand. And again, it's a big name. The only, I guess, downside from Bulgari is people still sort of have to get over that mental block that it's a jewelry company. Right. Oh, believe me, Bulgari is a big watch company and, and a watch company in a big way. They're here to stay, and they're not going anywhere. I wouldn't be surprised if they went out there and it's picked the up some of them. The same exact thing could be said about Harry Winston. Uh, let's talk about, uh, if, you know, if, if we're going to go, let's go to the Richmond group. Let's talk about Panerai, right? Everybody's saying Panerai is long forgotten. Nobody talks about Panerai anymore. The Although Panerai we sell them very well. Panerai, very, very well. Panerai is, is still one of our top selling brands. And the reason for that is because, A, there's a big following for Panerai. And oddly enough, a lot of guys out there that want to get out there get, number one, a military style watch. What are your options? Military style watches, you're going to go to Panerai? especially if you're gonna go into the world of diving, right? Uh, Navy, et cetera. Bell you're gonna go to Don Ross, you're gonna go to IWC. IWC is more, pi- more air, 
a Panerai is more, uh, what do you call it? Ground. Uh, gra uh, no, water. Yeah. And Bell & Ross is uh, so yeah. in both places. Right, right, right. It's all over the place. Now, granted, a lot of those brands out there have their lines and their particular, you know, certain watches that are going to fit in both of those categories. You can, I can name a bunch of them off the top of my head, be it a Marine from Breguet, be it uh, the Marines from Ulysse and Ardan, and all that. Although Ulysse and Ardan's sport line is very Marine themed. But for the most part, when people think about military style watches, the first thing they're going to reach for is probably either IWC or Panerai. And where did Panerai Absolutely. get their roots? They got their roots from the military, right? The Italian Navy. Uh, I'm super excited about this one because this brings me back. It's the Pan 196 Daylight, the one Sylvester Stallone wore in the movie Daylight. Uh, this one, the bracelet was actually added to it. It originally came just on a strap, but when we, so we bought it from a client that had both the bracelet and the strap, which is really cool. But if you look at Panerai, it does nothing but scream military style watches. Look at this dial. I mean, mm -hmm. this tobacco dial Pam, I forget what the Pam number is. This is, the pan, this, this is the 20th anniversary for the Panerisi. Oh, right. This is the 20th anniversary for the Panerisi. Speaking of Panerisi, Panerisi was huge. The people collecting Panerais were called Panaristi, and then there was a forum called Panaristi.com. Yeah. And what I don't know, to believe it or not, and I'd love to find out if any of you guys know, comment below, what came first, the Panaristi forum or the people collecting Panerai being called Panaristi and then the forum? I still don't, I still don't know the answer, yeah, what came, the answer to that the question. Yeah, what came the chicken or the egg, right? What came first, the chicken or the egg. But yeah. look, Panerai is, is still very much alive. If you look at some of their newer stuff, their Carbotech line, Carbotech's I think sick. it's absolutely amazing. Sick, yeah. We've seen a bunch of those in person. They don't last. Yeah. The minute we get any of these carbon techs in, they go right out the door. And uh, don't think that Panerai is dead or will be dead anytime soon. I've talked about Panerai before where I felt like they still could use some reinvention from within the brand. Uh, but I feel like the Richmond group is just saying, look, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Do you think, maybe, do you think maybe it has to do with case size? Do you think that's a big... No, but uh, as of late, have you seen some of their smaller stuff that's been coming out? They came out with a beautiful ladies' piece. It was a, a Lady Marina, which is absolutely gorgeous. I forget the reference on it because it's PAM something. Uh, with that, <laughs> you don't say. Yeah, with, that, with that said, I think Panerai is... Panerai is certainly a brand that's here to stay. And maybe the reason Richmond Group is not listening to my advice, well, probably because they're not watching my videos, number one. But number two, maybe because it's one of those things. If it's not broke, don't fix it. I think they have enough of a cult following based on the production numbers that they put out for, their, for, for the supply and demand just to be in check. Apparently, they're selling enough. So that goes for Panerai. Right? And speaking of the Richmond Group, let's talk about the watchmaker's brand, right? The watchmaker's watchmaker. And that's, let's do this right, GG Lecoute. GG Lecoute, yeah. I, also known as the most unpronounceable brand in the world. That's why we call it JLC for short. We, I call it Jaeger. Okay, so let's talk about Jaeger. Every time you say Jaeger, I think Jaegermeister. Ever since I was a kid and I, and I started working with Roman. By the way, Jaegermeister is some of the most... I was like 16 years old, Roman was like, Jaeger. I'm like, Jaegermeister? Jaeger <laughs> I, I, first tried, I first tried Jaegermeister when I was in the military. I was cool. at Fort Knox. And when the weekend came, basically you had the one guy, the one designated drunk that would, would literally take one of those humongous trash cans on wheels, line it with brand new trash bags, throw a bunch of fruit in there, and then we just go door to door and door to door, and just whatever alcohol you had. Oh, you got gin, let's put it in there. You got vodka, let's put it in there. It became the cocktail of death, is what we called it. And what really kills you wasn't- yeah, There's a name for that. What's the name? Um, I, I don't know. Jungle juice. Jungle, jungle, jungle juice. That's yeah. pretty much what we made, right? We called it the cocktail of death. And what happens was, is that once you've done, whoever had whatever liquor in the room, once you dump it all in there, you, you, you know, add a Kool-Aid, let it sit for a little bit, and then, you know, a day later, if you eat one of the fruit, you just, you, yeah. you might as well go right to the hospital, right? But a buddy of mine, he was big into Jägermeister right across the hall from my room. His name was Shane, actually, I remember. And he's like, you got to try this. This is like older age. And I'm like, look, I, I heard it was disgusting. He's like, no, you're going to love it. I took a shot of that. And I'm just like, it's probably the worst thing I've ever tasted in my life. It was just terrible. I, yeah, it's, called, it's like carf syrup. It's, 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 I think it's yeah. worse. So anyway, back to, how do we get on to... Uh, Jaeger, Jaeger, my Jaeger Lecoultre. Oh, from Jaeger Lecoultre. Okay, I got you. So Jaeger, Jaeger, the watchmaker's watchmaker, right? Guys that have do so much work for other brands. And Bucks Chronograph, yeah. right? How many chronographs do you know out there that exist where you set off the chronograph by depressing the crystal? It's very cool. It's the only one, right? It's a very gimmicky conversation watch that can be had under $10,000, right? There yeah, is, it's not considered a mono pusher. It's, but it's not a mono pusher because you depress the bottom. No, but it's, it's, it is technically one push. No, it's not because you actually, what you do is you actually press the bottom, the bottom to set it off and then 
stop it and then to reset it you have to press okay, the top right. of the crystal. So, so it's actually it. not a minor pusher. But minor pusher. again, is it that big of a deal? I think it is. I think, I think it's, it's the only cool. I think it's the only one of its kind. Size wise, looks wise, everything about this screams racing, sporty cars, just everything about you know, you think of a chronograph, the very first thing that pops off in your head is cars racing, right? And when you look at this watch, it's exactly what you see. I gotta say, a lot of people that have JLCs and, and that wear them, they, they get a lot of respect from the watch community. Because if you're wearing a JLC, you understand everything behind the brand. Dual right? metrics. Yeah, incredible. incredible. You, can incredible pick up, you can pick up a gold dual metrics. It's a very it's a highly dollars. respectable watch to wear, in my opinion, JLC. Like when I see somebody wear a JLC, I'm like, hey, you know, you know they say like a picture uh, says a thousand words or whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? Watches are the ultimate form of communication nowadays. When I see somebody wearing a JLC, I'm like, hey, that dude knows what he's talking about, you know? Huh. Or that lady knows what she's talking about. Reverse those for ladies, under $10,000, one of my favorite watches. How about going backwards a little bit and go to the master compressor line, right? A thousand hour testing for every watch carries. Wait, people overlook this, you know? The, the, with the master control series, they overlook the fact that these watches are tested up to a thousand hours, which is absolutely insane in terms of quality. Like, how about this? I've never had anything come back to me from a client from the master control hour or from the master compressor line. Because the quality control they do with these watches is absolutely insane. They have the ability to do so because they do it for so many other brands. Yeah. And imagine if you're selling off chronographs to somebody or movements to somebody. somebody. <coughs> AP. <laughs> right. I mean, the 15202 finally just yeah. now stopped using the, the JLC 920 movement, right? Which is a great machine. And the, and the reason it lasted so long is because it was that good, right? Alarms is another one. The, this, is, this is one of their newer models. Look at this dial. You know, they're finally starting to see the light and, and saying, okay, you know what? Oh, Gashron is doing beautiful dials. Yeah, Hold my beer. Look at this focus dial. On the, on the I dial. mean, look at, look, at, look at this beautiful dial. And again, and I know you guys are thinking, oh my God, all of these are under 10,000. Yes, yes. There's deals to be had on brands outside of the spotlight, right? But I love what you said in regards to, uh, I see somebody wearing a Jaeger. I give a lot of respect to that individual because it takes, a, it takes a buyer that understands yeah. to pick up a Jaeger and to see the value in Jaeger as a brand, a value as in watches. And of course, last but not least, I'm gonna talk about what to me is in the top 10 most iconic watches ever made in total, and that, I is, actually the, have, that uh, is the Reverso. I have, I have something guilty to say about the Reverso. So for the longest time, obviously, if, it, if you're a younger guy, you know, you look at a reverse, you're like, you know, what is this grandpa watch, right? Because it's a small, small case, it's, it's rectangular, it, it doesn't really meet the status quo of, of, of the hype, right? Up until Jay-Z wore one. And then you're I, such a I, sucker. I am, I'm such a sucker. Like I fell right into so, the trap so, and I'm so, like, you know so what, this me, watch is super cool. So for me, so for me. Because let me, let me just explain it to you. He like the way he wore it with a tux at the time, right? I think he was at the uh, Grammys or one of one of those award shows, and and when I saw him wearing it with a tux, I'm like, this is a vibe. Like this is a look. This is something new. You know, this is a vibe. This is to me, it's history. You know, going back to Art Deco times when the first Reversa came out, it was the first watch of its kind where the actual case of the watch had number of parts. I think the original Reversa had 17 parts in the case. Today, it's, I think it's like 26 when parts. It came in out the 1931. Case. Yeah, Reversa. Uh, we have one here. We yeah. should have brought it. We actually, and oddly enough, you can pick up the vintage one, the original one, which is tiny, tiny. You can pick that one up under ten thousand dollars. I think yeah. we're, we're selling one for like seven grand. I think. But fact of the matter is, due to high production volume. You can pick up a multitude of reversals today for under ten thousand yep. uh, dollars. Speaking of other iconic watches, I know I know this. You're gonna say this is a Roman buy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Piaget, the Piaget coin watch. Now I just discussed uh, most iconic watches out there. Let me pop this sucker open so you guys can see the actual watch. But I am gonna uh, go back to those ten most iconic watches, and I do believe that. The coin watch deserves to be in that collection, except in the top not, ten. Yes, except not from Piaget, but from Coram, who <laughs> made it in 1964. But everybody jumped on a bandwagon. It was it was it was in style with the time. Uh, Piaget did it. Coram did it. Audemars Piguet did it. Patek Philippe did it. Everybody and their mother took a twenty dollar coin, right? And here's the back of it. Obviously, everybody took a twenty dollar coal coin and they put a watch inside. Which, in itself, if you go back sixty years, it's it's kind of a hell of a novelty, right? It's very reminiscent of, you know, the pocket watch, which was still relevant in the 60s, yeah. and just a cool watch altogether. You're thinking, oh my God, this should be such a rare collectible, and so on and so forth, and it's a big gold watch, and it's made out of a $20 coin, and blah, 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 blah. 
you guys have to understand something. The reason this watch is trading, you know, under 10,000, way under 10,000 actually, is because of things like demand, right? There's not a whole lot of demand out there for a watch like that. But going back to what you said, if Jay-Z put that watch on and during yeah, the next becomes, award, yeah. all of a sudden it becomes cool, it becomes, oh my God, I want one. Jackie Kennedy's little tiny tank. Cartier tank was tank, sold yeah. off an auction, I think like $350,000. How many calls I got from my wife's friends, it's like, oh, can you get me that watch? It's a $1,500 watch that you can buy. Yeah. Well, obviously not that's owned by Jackie Kennedy, but yep. it just goes to show that we live in a world where trends can be so much influenced by celebrities, by the Adrian Taskins in the world. You know, you, you guys can get influenced easily yeah. on a big scale such as Jay-Z and a very small scale like our YouTube channel because, again, this is the world that we live in. But the whole purpose of this exercise is to show you guys that if you're reaching for a watch, be it a starter watch, or you're growing your collection, you're staying within that 10,000 and under budget, is that options are endless. We brought up, what, I don't know, 25, 30 watches? We could have brought up 300 watches, yeah. except this video would have been six hours long. Well, between the fact that I like to talk a lot. And, you don't say. No, <laughs> and the fact that we have a lot of these watches. But the bottom line is this, we finally came to a time where I'm actually happy. I wasn't happy six months ago to a year when there was so much FOMO, there was so much of that impulse to buy now, otherwise I am going scramble. to miss out on the deal. It was a scramble. It, people, it was a scramble, right? Granted, it mostly happened in watches, uh, you know, there were more of the hype models, but that affected everything else under the sun mm -hmm. because when a person called in, be it a Jaeger, a Paddock, or whatever it might be. Oh, it was the same thing. Listen, when, like, oh my God, I gotta buy it now. To, when we used to be able to, to order the likes of JLC or even IWC or even Panoram, a, a significant discount from our suppliers. Yeah, of course. You were paying retail. Yeah, but when it comes to watches, probably outside of Rolex, but everything else that we showed you here, throughout time, it's allowed you guys the opportunity to actually sit back and say, okay, I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna do my research, I'm gonna see what options are available out to me, which is why you know, we tell our salespeople one thing first, thing, educate your consumer to a point where he would feel stupid to buy anywhere else besides you regardless of price, within reason, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's why you are able to do this with the help of a salesperson from our company, any other company. This is, your, this is what your expectation should be. Anybody who's on the other line trying to sell you, wants your expectation should be to learn something new plus do your own research, don't fall into the impulse buy things, and you will quickly realize just how many options you have out there when it comes to buying a watch 10,000 and under. And I don't think I even showed everything, I'm just gonna quickly show you. Here's a brand new, gold, here, here, here's a golden square Roger Dubuis in, in gold. Here's an older Paddock in gold. Here's an older Blanc Pond in gold. All these watches are $10,000 and under. There's so many options out there. It allows you, once you open up those blinders and get out of the, let's say the top three, Cartier, Rolex, and Omega, there's dozens more brands out there that are available. How about independence, right? Daniel Roth, these have actually become hot. They, I've seen these double in price over the last, uh, I don't know, it's a couple of years because collectors are quickly realizing that Daniel Roth is that next collectible. Now owned by Bulgari, obviously, but the original Daniel Roth is, they're big to do. We didn't even get into talking about IWC. I mean, I, I brought, what did we bring? We brought a, uh, we got the Portuguese on the bracelet. This is one of the newer models as well. So there's just so many options out there. And I guess the purpose of this video is to tell you, if we leave you with one thing, and that one thing is going to be, don't impulse buy. If you are in that price range of 10,000 under, regardless whether you can afford a $50,000 watch, a lot more watches are out there available. There's not a whole lot of richer meals being made because they're so expensive. But watches, especially on the secondary market that are pre-owned, you can get into a paddock, you can get into a Blanc Pond, you can get into a Rolex, you can get into a slew of things, the variety is endless. Just take the time yep. and don't impulse buy. Absolutely. Final thoughts? Final thoughts, I mean, you pretty much hit the nail on the head where there's just endless, endless amounts of buys out there under $10,000. And what you're actually getting in the key term here is value, right? From a complication side of things, from a historic side of things, from a utility side of things, just absolutely, you know, don't don't always go for for, for the hype. Don't always go for. There's nothing wrong with hype. It's right. always great to have that in the collection because the hype pieces are the pieces that people like to wear every day. They they kick them around. The Samaritans, the they just. But there is, like you said, so much value out there. Even from a brand IWC. I mean, I think overall in their entire catalog, I much think, like Jaeger. 
What very much like late Jaeger. I think IWC is probably overall their overall catalog watches that can be purchased on ten thousand is is my personal favorite. A lot of the Spitfires, the Portofinos. I mean, the Portuguese, Portuguese. You know, speaking of iconic watches, the original yeah. Portuguese is on my grill list to own. Like the actual original. Granted, they go for about a hundred thousand, but yeah, that's I mean, one of that's one of my grill pieces to put in my collection. And why don't we say this? I personally tell me if you agree or disagree. A collection of 20 watches that consists of nothing but Rolex is not a collection. I mean, it's a Rolex collection. <laughs> okay, yeah. let's agree to disagree, guys. We want to thank you for tuning in. As always, like, comment, share, subscribe. Any, any suggestions you have for me, Adrian, uh, on the future videos are obviously always welcome. And we'll see you on the next one.